Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Okay, so today we're going to be looking at the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire, sometimes fondly known as the, the Empire of Byzantium, sometimes known as the Empire of Constantine. The main thing is, in the last days of the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, this is basically all that remained of it, its city itself, and the Peloponnese down in Greece. Now, I've, I've been doing a nice bit of research on this, and this is the fifth time I've done this lecture this week. Uh, when, when, you're doing, when, you're, when you're doing lectures and you've gone over them a number of times, uh, it's at this point, hopefully, I can happily say that um, we've got everything that we need to say uh, in regards to the fall of this wonderful civilization. And if you can, if you can all sort of um, close your eyes a moment um, and think of the following statement. Fall of Byzantium, the slow death of empire. Here we go. Imagine a man down a steep, rocky mountain. He might have so much control as to slide left or roll right. Perhaps he could aim for the flattish, gravelly stretch right before the precipice. Or he could continue down the hard pack slope and then go off the precipice. Whatever choice he makes, his destiny is out of his hands. Every decision he makes can only determine what particular flavour of disaster he will encounter. What new set of bad choices he must choose from next. And that describes quite nicely the last 200 years of this empire. Initially, it could be said that this, this illuminating empire began with quite an auspicious start. Um, on the deathbed of Constantine the Great, we see the beginning of an empire after 337 um, AD, an empire that was to last over 1,100 years. An empire that was a lot more than what you're seeing in front of you now. It was an empire that covered half of the Eastern Roman world. And later, in the 560s, dominated a big chunk of the Western Roman Empire as well. But one thing must be said is that if you can follow my cursor on the screen, all this area within these walls of Theodosius is actually of green fields agriculture. And what I would like to do is bring up my, my little annotation tools, which I'm going to bring onto the screen. So here we go. So, uh, in thinking about the, the last years of the Roman Empire in the East, all of this area has been abandoned, simply because the population of um, Constantinople, which would have ranged into the hundreds of thousands by about 1453, was a population that had gone down to a mere 50,000. So all these areas outlined by the green arrows are no longer occupied other than by agriculture. The other thing that must be said is that initially Constantinople was defended by one set of walls here. And then later on, you can't see it on the plan, but believe me, there's another set of defenses along this line. And then finally, you've got the walls of Theodosius, constructed around AD 420. This is a city full of various um, forums, various colonnaded roads, and the center of the um, Greek Orthodox Church, the Hagia Sophia. And what I'd like to do now is, is slowly start to show you a number of other images. So that's where we're going to go. Uh, here we go. 
Much of what could be said about the Byzantine Empire is an empire um, within its very last days is under siege by the great Sultan Mehmed II. And there is Mehmed II on his horse. And he's got armies of janissaries. He's got an army of between 80 and 120,000 men versing the f defenders on these very tall walls three sets of walls actually the other set of walls isn't showing um there's one set of walls there two sets of walls and three sets of walls so this army attacking constantinople in 1453 um, from the 1st of april all the way to the 29th of may is an army that outnumbers the the constantine de defenders by around 10 or 12 to 1. so the, the odds of the defenders of Constantinople holding out were very limited, but they held out for 50 days in the hope that they're going to be assisted by Christians from Europe. But all that we do say about this wonderful city is a city that started off with great origins and great aspirations. I turn to my wonderful publication which looks at all the emperors of the Roman world in both the West and the East. This is the city as it once stood in the reign of Justinian I, who became the sole Roman emperor of what was left of the Roman world in 527 and all the Roman Empire in the East. He reigned for 38 years. Like most Byzantine emperors, he died of natural causes unlike most of the 121 emperors of the Western Roman world, and most of them being assassinated, killed, um, having horrible deaths, and so on, and so on. So that gives you an idea of stability. Some of the leaders of the, of the Eastern Roman world reigned for over 50 years, which puts it in, in, on par with our great monarchs like Queen Victoria, or Elizabeth II, or even Elizabeth I. Which, which offers you great stability. Just a little reminder on the screen, anyone who wants to join us tomorrow at, uh, between one o'clock and two o'clock on, on YouTube, be very, very welcome. Where we actually talk about um, all the conclusions we've made about this lecture throughout the week. So going back to this, this is, this is a rather interesting image. This has to be an image that portrays Constantinople around the year um, 540. And why does it, look as if it's an image from about 540. Because one year later, you've got a, a ter terrifically um, hard hitting um, virus known as the Justinian plague. And the Justinian plague itself is believed to wipe out around 150 million people within a world population of half a billion. So it's got a death rate of up to a third. And this hit the hearts and minds of the Eastern Roman world, again, to its very heart. However, this was in fact the greatest period of the empire of Justinian. This was the greatest period of the empire of the Eastern Roman world. This was the greatest moment within the heat of this terrible virus. Now, it's to give you an, to give you a sort of an idea of the geography. So um, up in the um, up here, that's known as the Bosporus. This is known as the Great Horn, and this is the Sea of Marmara. And then you go to um, you you go then directly out into the Aegean Sea, um, and above north, heads directly into the Black Sea, um, and this site itself is key to all trade with the Black Sea. This, this, is, this is a key locality. And this is a site that fell a number of times. And the most catastrophic event for the Eastern Roman world was actually its capture uh, by the damnable um, Christians uh, that have come here due to a crusade, a crusade um, called by the then Pope. And this this is a site that suffered greatly um, in 1204 and after it suffered greatly in 1204 
it never ever recovered as an empire. Now, what I'd like to do, I'd like to go back to my little bit of a text. And there's a little bit of a plan. So this, this, is, this, is, the, um, this is the period of the siege. And the, this, this time, this moment, the period of the siege itself sort of shows out where all the armies of Mehmed II are, his navy. Uh, and the little red fertilla shows you of the Genoese, Byzantine and Venetian vessels. Now, when you, when you look at um, the fall of Constantinople, you're never told about this, this place here, which is called Pera. Pera itself was not actually part of the city of Constantinople. Pera, in fact, uh, was a, a settlement that was um, governed by the Venetians. And at that time, the Venetians were friends with M Mehmed's army um, that was now besieging Constantinople after April 1453. Lots of amazing things to say about this, but what I would like to do before we go any further is actually move on a sec and let's go to where we need to be. Again, that now. This is the idea of Sophia. Such was the plight of Byzantium in the last 200 years of its existence. As we opened with, any of those men or women rolling down the proverbial hill that are controlling Byzantium, the Byzantine Empire, has got to make one, two or three choices or even more. But no matter what choice they make, the choice will eventually lead to the downfall of this empire. There was no way out of it. There could have been, there could have been the main direction and just to have abandoned the city. But sooner or later, the, the, this empire was going to fall. It was like the old man of Europe, as, Ottoman, as the Ottoman world was once described uh, in the 1800s. <coughs> Byzantium was the old man of Europe and Asia in the uh, late 12, 13, and the um, first half of the 1400s. Such was the plight of Byzantium in, in the last two centuries of its existence. The empire lay completely at the mercy of external forces. Powerful enemies encroached from every cardinal direction. These enemies not just being people, not just being ravaging hordes, but these enemies being disasters natural disasters, earthquakes, disasters like plague, mass flooding, and so on. And it's almost as if no sooner had the Byzantine Empire got back on its feet again, it was struck at the most inopportune moments. As in Candide, Voltaire would write, in the most inopportune moments, all is for the best, in this best of possible worlds. And Candide will later go on to explain, this is the only world that we have. And this is the only world the Byzantines had because they were surrounded by Christians that didn't like them, even though they were Christians. They were surrounded by Muslim states that didn't like them. And the Hagia Sophia is basically the epitome of what any conquest of a city should or maybe shouldn't be. However, the Hagia Sophia today stands in its glory. And the only major changes after Mehmed captured the city on the, on the day of the 29th of May of 1453, the only changes were not to have the Hagia Sophia set alight, not to remove the beautiful paintings, not to change anything about it, not to change the columns, not to change the floor, not to change the windows and the backdrop, not to change the angels. All he said was to have Allah, Wahba, Allah be praised. Those, those are the only major um, changes that we see. I hear today that um, the Turkish president has actually decided to um, close this as a museum and make it um, back into a mosque, which would probably be a good thing, to be honest with you. And the reason why I say that having too many tourists entering in this building 
is causing to it decaying because all of the decay up here is being caused by bacteria from those tourists and daily prayer and limited numbers would mean that we've got a longer longevity for this original Christian site. So, this, this site itself was captured because Mehmed II decreed that when the city is to be overrun, this building and many other buildings in Constantinople are to be left untouched. Just as the American and the Russian Air Force decided in the Second World War that certain key buildings in Berlin were not to be touched, this was a similar circumstance. Throughout the latter years of the Byzantine world, its troops were few and the treasury to pay armies was now empty due to the Crusaders looting and pillaging through Constantinople in 1204. Internal divisions would have their say, and the empire staggered from one crisis to another as its position steadily eroded. The corrosion of the effects of its past also dawned into the present. Its destiny was truly out of its hands. The fall of Byzantium for 200 years seemed imminent, but it kept on. It's just, like, it's just like a very, very bad relationship. You wish to keep that relationship going, even though both of you know it's a bad idea. So, uh, but eventually that relationship will collapse. It will go down a precipice. One person had to make the decision and the person that made the decision that day in 1453, the Byzantines decided to de declare war on the um, Islamic empire they caused the decline of their own world to the very last day. The empire had been on this desperate plunge since 1204. The Fourth Crusade sacked Constantinople and forced the imperial court into exile for 57 years. Byzantium had endured many harrowing crises up until that point, but it always bounced back up until 1204 but was always saved by some man or woman of genius, a savior emperor or empress along the lines of Heraclius or Alexius Comnius, who could pull the empire back from the precipice. But no longer after 1204 were they to be saved. Let's look at a few more images. Let's move on a little bit more. Now, if anyone's ever seen this image, they will be aware of the reign of Leo the Fourth, and um, actually Leo the Fifth. I got the wrong Leo there. I can be um, I can be forgiven for that. Leo the Fifth. And the the one thing that can be said is that within from about the eight hundreds onwards, you have a group of people joining the Byzantines who we now know as the Veriginian. For a good 250, 300 years, the Veriginian Guard protected the emperors of Byzantium. The Veriginian Guards, if you know people, otherwise known as the Swedish Vikings. For 250 years, they were there to protect Byzantium. But over 100 years before the crusade reached there in 1204, these Vikings were gone. And why were these Vikings gone? Let's talk a little bit more. Hang on a minute. There you go. We'll come back to those images now. Why were these Vikings gone? Well, it's quite simple, really. The Vikings left after 250 years because the, the king of Sweden would, would turn around to say, hang on, if you go and help the Byzantine king, if your father dies whilst you're gone, I go to inherit the estate, not you. And the Swedish Vikings were saying, that's not very fair. And the king of Sweden would go, hang on a minute, it's very fair. You come back with more gold than I actually gain in taxes every year. Why shouldn't it be fair? And also, if Sweden's attacked, I've got no soldiers to defend it. 
so what would happen eventually is is the Swedish stop going to the heart of the Byzantine Empire and stop defending uh, the Byzantine Emperor. And the reason the reason why um, the emperors employed the Vikings was that they couldn't trust their own men. So they decided to get 5,000 Vikings down to assist them. And they were paid, paid very handsomely. Um, some of them a lifetime's wages in five years service. This is rather interesting. We'll go back to the Ag Hagia Sophia now, but this is actually a carving. Um, and you can see in the stone, Halvadan. Um, and it's saying at the top there, the rest of it is actually unpronunciation. Uh, it, can, it hasn't been transcribed, but it probably is if I sit down and try to work that out. But in the Hagia Sophia itself, we know that the Vikings are there, not just in the historical record, not in the um, artist impressions that we just seen from about the 850s, that, that wonderful thing of Leo V, where Leo V is assassinated. And then the emperors think, right, okay, what we need to do we need to get these, some people in to defend us. This is what's happening. Um, and this is actually carved into the marble. There's lots of carvings um, within the marble at the Hagia Sophia. And I think one of the key reasons why they want to open it now as a mosque and not a museum is because of the damage being caused to it by tourists. There you go. There's Leo being dragged away. And there's a Varaginian guard coming in to sort of save the day in regards to the emperors. This is the Hagia Sophia. Now, if you, if you sort of close your eyes a little bit and sort of flutter them, um, you're looking at what the Ag Hagia Sophia looked like over um, 600 years ago, at the, times, at the time that Hagia Sophia was still in the hands of the Christians. Those four minarets are the only things actually being added. This is a great building indeed. It's a very, very important building. And actually, if you actually look there, you can actually see some of the, um, some of the sea walls which would have actually been used at the time to defend against these various attacks and you know it, it didn't go down well this morning when i said i'm not completely on the side of the christians in regards to this lecture today um because i i i sort of come down in a biased and biased way on on whatever side because um Mehmed deciding that, that there were buildings within Constantinople which were not to be destroyed under any circumstance is a sign of a very civilized individual indeed. Because if, if his men would have gone wantingly into Constantinople, they would have burnt and destroyed everything. Just like a Christian would have done um, if they all trampled into uh, Jerusalem. Um, you know, but he was very sensible, a very, very noble leader. He had the likes of Saladin the Great in the 1170s inside him um, when he was he had a sense not to have everything burnt down he had a sense of respect of religion as well because um, lots of the greek orthodox churches were spared destruction lots of them were spared destruction which is which is very very important um, unfortunately to actually make their money back for the campaign they um, um, a large number of those that were captured um, were placed in slavery. But word of warning, don't read any text to say that all the people of Constantinople were enslaved. Tens of thousands actually did escape that day. Um, and it was only people who were stupid enough to have stayed behind that were enslaved in the first place. Um, just like any, anybody who's involved in religion, all those nuns, um, all those monks decided to stay behind thinking that they, they wouldn't be placed into slavery, and they were. But that is for the end of this lecture. No man, such, no such man appeared to rescue Byzantium in its last days. The problems were too great, too numerous and too fundamental. For at the time of the um, reign of, of Justinian, this is how big the empire was. All the orange areas um, is what the Eastern um, Roman Empire looked like. And then after this plague and through the plague, the Eastern um, Roman soldiers conquered Italy, um, that part of uh, Africa, um, a, a, a substantial chunk of Spain, um, and obviously the old U Yugoslavia. And if there hadn't have been the plague in the first place, we might still be talking Latin today. Um, simple, simple, sim simple as 
is that if the Byzantine army would have continued back over those um, Alps, back all the way across France, they would have undoubtedly reached out to those people who still felt they were Roman in Britain. Uh, there would have been a no Anglo-Saxon period and history would have been very different. But then again, history would have been very different if Germany had won the war as well. So, you know, we can talk about all these things. And this building's rather important uh, to, at the end of the lecture, actually. This is known as the Hippodrome. And in fact, the Hippodrome was in a ruined estate by 1453. But however, Mehmed used it as a place of a rally um, to thank his soldiers um, for the campaign against Constantinople. And we've got a tiny bit of archaeological evidence um, examining the Hippodrome. Now, I did mention about these, these heroes. I did mention about um, Heraclius. I did mention about the, the fact that before um, 12, 1204, there would always be these heroes to save the Byzantine Empire. And Heraclius is a very important figure. And why? He's not just somebody who saves the Byz Byzantine Empire. This is a man who's responsible for the Islamic religion gaining its empire and conquest over Christendom. And why is that? Now, Heraclius, uh, as, we, as we turn to my pages in my wonderful book, what does it say about Heraclius? He reigns for 30 years, dies of natural causes. Um, he, su he succeeds in 608 as emperor after a little bit of um, problems. And uh, Heraclius, he defeats the Sassanid Empire. We will be looking at the Sassanid Empire in the future. But he defeats the Sassanid Empire at the Battle of Nineveh. Nineveh is north of Baghdad um, in Iraq. And this is in the year 627. And those that know anything about Islam and Jesus being a prophet of Islam and all those gubbins, will know that Muhammad is going to rise very soon. And when Muhammad rises, he rises against an empire that's been destroyed by Emperor Heraclius of the Byzantines. By defeating the Sassanid Empire, it means that the Sassanid world is so weakened that any faith that's rising in the form of Muhammad's faith um, will be able to defeat the Sassanids take over the Sassanid world and then build an empire of their own. Um, with, with a positive, there's a negative. Yeah? This, this, this defeating the Sassanid empire would come back and haunt the Byzantines. Where there's a yin, there's a yang. All those sayings are true. Where there's a cause, there's a consequence. All that's very true. And, the, and 627, if he had not defeated the Sassanid empire, would never have seen the rise of uh, of Islam. And the fighting in Europe would have been between the Greek Orthodox and the Roman Church. Um, and that's what we'd be talking about today. Um, so Heraclius, you may have saved the empire back in the day, but, uh, but you're talking about 800 years later, the Islamic empire would take over his world. But there's something that I haven't said. And we will say that in a moment. The problems after the problems after 1204 were too great, too numerous and too fundamental. Collapse took a long time in an empire as rich and mighty as Byzantium. Two centuries between the recovery of Constantinople and the fall of the same to the Turks. And there were many ups and downs before that along the way. At at times, it seemed as if a substantial recovery was likely. Maybe the Byzantine world could have become what it once was, but it was never to be. The inexorable logic of decline prevailed. Dilemma after dilemma put the empire in a steadily worsening position. Do you know, you all, you all know about the person who's digging a pit and they keep digging it and they should just stop digging. They should leave while they could. The Byzantine Empire keeps digging that pit, keeps digging and digging and digging. And then eventually there's nothing left. 
But this isn't the end of the Roman world. And this may come, of, come as a great surprise to all of you. And what might come as a great surprise to all of you is that after uh, Mehmed II, Mehmed the Conqueror, had captured Constantinople, the Roman Empire would last until 1919. And why? The answer is quite simple. The Roman Empire, the Roman world, not the empire, the kingdoms and all the rest of it, and then the empires, were founded in 753 BC. Then you find the Roman Empire being created uh, by around um, 29 BC by Octavian, otherwise known as Augustus. And then the Roman Empire, the Roman world in the West, continues in, until 476. And for nearly another thousand years, the Roman Empire in the East continues until 1453. Mehmed himself felt he was the embodiment of a Roman emperor. Mehmed felt that all he was doing was reunifying the Roman world. Mehmed was at the head of an army that was now um, part of the new Roman Empire. And this new Roman Empire was called the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire lasted until 1919, after the armistice of the Great War. So in other words, the Roman Empire lasted, or the Roman world, from 753 BC all the way to 1919. That may sound strange, but the aim of Mehmed, and for the next 200 years, the aim of all the sultans of the Ottoman Empire was to conquer the whole of Europe. And in doing so, would have unified the Roman world into one. It's a really strange, quirky concept. Some historians would disagree with that, but some historians would agree, and so would archeologists. And the other point as well is, is that when Mussolini was saying in 1922, he wanted to recreate the Roman empire, this was the new Roman empire, but there'd already been a new Roman empire before him. So I think, the dilemma in understanding this is not looking at religion, is looking at what the Roman world meant um, and how far ranging the Roman world was. Mehmed admired the Romans. They admire, he admired their civilization. He wanted to be like them. He wanted his empire to be like the Roman Empire. And lo and behold, it was. Um, I just mentioned about um, earlier on, there was a leader known as... Um, Comnenus, the Comnenus dynasty, um, and this itself, this itself is is another period when you see ups and you see downs and you see ups and you see downs, all the way until the year twelve o four. We're going to go back again. So let's look a, a little bit at this. The um, this is. This is the problem of Constantinople. You've got the Bosporus, you've got the Black Sea, you've got the Mamara. Um, and the problem is that Istanbul is always going to be in, a, in, a, in an area that there's always going to be problems. You know, there's always going to be problems to do with this being a key locality, a key locality on the trade link. It's going to be strategically important. That's the point. And we could say that these emperors were despotic. We could see that, we could say that, um, you know, they were nothing there than the glory, but that's very incorrect. These were emperors having to make decisions. And the ones in the last 200 years, you've got to give them a lot of respect. Now, this itself is one of a number of mosaics associated with those emperors of the Constantine world. You could be looking at a representation of Constantine XI, the last emperor of the Byzantine world to actually reign from Constantinople. 
and each of those each of those tessera are actually made of gold that is actually a golden tessera and you've got garnet and you've got emerald and you've got lapras lazuli um and you've got um you've got sunstones in there as well that itself is 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 a rich mosaic a, a rich a, a rich broadcast of what the Byzantine world was about. And no wonder Mehmed wanted to rule over it um, and become the new emperor in a way. And now this, this is rather interesting. Um, outside the coastline of Istanbul, Byzantium, Constantinople, Istanbul, that's its name today, Istanbul. Um, in the in the Golden Horn, the area of the Golden Horn, um, when they've been making polder dikes um, in low-lying areas, they've actually been excavating um, a large number of Byzantine, Genoese, Venetian, um, and Islamic vessels, Ottoman vessels. Um, and you can see that this one went down with all its cargo. Uh, this, would be, this would be one of those vessels I'd refer to as a, a coastal hugger. Uh, with with one with one um, with one sail, with a nice prow and an aft, um, probably quite low in the water because of the ca cargo it's carrying, and this alas sank. But these types of cargoes made the Byzantine world, and the Ottoman, as as it late, as as we see then, and the Genoese and the Venetians. This was a this was a world of trade. This was a world of economy and commerce. This wasn't just a world of fighting all the time. And this could be many scenes. This could be many of the scenes um, before that moment uh, that the Ottoman Empire had taken over. And this is where we go next. But before we go here, we need to look at... Bum, bum, bum. John the Sixth. And why do we look at John the Sixth? Why do we need to look at all these emperors? Because John the Sixth is a rather important emperor. He's the epitome of everything that we can say went wrong with the um, Byzantine world, even though he tried to get everything right. But John, 1347. What happened in 1347? But alas, we need to do 1204 first. So in 1204, we see, um, we see Constantinople captured by the Crusaders. And if anyone's a Catholic here, you won't be happy with what I'm just about to say. The Fourth Crusade between 1202 and 1204 uh, was a Latin Christian army um, called to go to the Holy Land by Pope Innocent III. This expedition itself was heading to Jerusalem to recapture it from the Muslims. And also, they were also going to capture Egypt. Because as lots of you know, Egypt Egypt is a very useful place for growing wheat. Um, and it would be very useful. So Pope Innocent III wasn't organizing this expedition because he just wanted to get Jerusalem back into the hands of the Christians. He also wanted the grain um, that is available in Egypt. So, you know, a bit of cynicism there. However, a sequence of economic and political events culminated in the Crusaders' army in 1204, sacking Constantinople. So this is basically um, the Roman uh, Catholic Church versus the Greek Orthodox Church. Um, two Christian armies fighting each other, uh, which is typical. In late 1202, a financial um, crisis within the Crusader army meant that they laid siege to the Catholic city of Zadar on the Adriatic coast. It's got beautiful ruins there today. Zada, Zara, Yugoslavia. Um, and this was under Venetian control. 
but it was a highly Catholic um, city. After the Crusader army had captured Zadar and put many people to the sword, after the Pope heard of this, he excommuted, excommunicated the Crusader army. Basically, they were no longer Christians, the whole army. They were no longer Christians. Uh, and in January 1203, they headed towards Constantinople. And the problem is, at that time, there was a little bit of a power struggle. Um, and Prince Alexius invited the Crusaders to the very gates of Constantinople. Anyway, the Crusaders said, oh, that's good. What are we doing here? And he said, oh, look, I, I might need you with a bit of a civil war to deal with, you know, within the Byzantine world. Uh, and no sooner, no sooner as he said this, the Crusaders said, you've got to feed us as well. So he said, OK, we'll feed you. Well, you've also got to give us a bit of money. So the Crusaders are now blackmailing the, the, um, the prince of Constantinople. Anyway, on the 23rd of June, 2003, until August 2003, uh, there was a siege. And this siege itself ended up by the following year in 1204 with the, the city being overrun by the Crusaders, being, being sacked, um, all wealth being pillaged away, um, it's, it's grain depots being emptied, you know, it was now a very, very poor city. However, the city itself had been the repository of all the wealth of the Roman world. And what I mean by that is in the reign of Constantine the Great, in the, in the um, 330s, up until the death of Constantine the Great in 337, um, Constantine the Great decreed that um, all the wealth of Rome was to go to Constantinople. You know, all the statues, you know, even, even some of those um, famous um, um, needles from Egypt, those Cleopatra needles were actually taken um, by barge all the way to Constantinople, you know, all the wealth. And it was only until um, 1204, uh, 900 years later, that that wealth suddenly left the beating heart of the Roman world after 900 years. So this was, this, was, this was a catastrophe for the emperors and princes of, of the uh, Byzantine Empire. And the after effect would be 200 years of, of slow, painful decline the sense of ever heading towards that precipice and the emperors having to make those decisions. This is what happened. It, it, it fell into all these bits. First Constantinople. Um, this is the Crusaders didn't leave. They thought, oh, and by the way, they didn't get to Jerusalem. They decided to stay around Constantinople. Um, and they, lots of these people were really, really wealthy at this point now. Um, so what you've got in Turkey, you've got the empire of Nakia. Um, you've got Greece falling into two zones. You've got the islands falling into another zone. You've got on the, um, the western coast, uh, the despotate of Epirus. Now, all those areas, the purple area and the orange area and the green area, were all part of um, the state of the Byzantine world. And it wouldn't be for another 57 years that it would all be reunited again. Um, and this is the empire in 1265. 200 years later, the empire would be over. So it's, it's, it's a nice little bit of a chunk, but you know, it's missing bits like Cyprus and Crete um, and some of the other zones. And obviously, where we need to go next, we need to go away from the year um, 1204. And we need to go to this figure I mentioned. And the figure I mentioned in the year 1347 was presiding against an event that would again change history. So what happened in 1347, Jessica? Not sure. In 1347, from the Black Sea and the East, came the Black Death. The fundamental problem is best understood by looking at the reign of um, Emperor John VI. 
one of the most significant emperors of this of the period throughout the whole of Europe. When John came to power in 1347, he had already spent several years at the highest levels of imperial administration. He pre presided as head of the civil service and the army. He was the right-hand man of an, of an Eastern Roman emperor who had reigned 50 years, a certain John V. Having an emperor reigning 50 years tells you how secure the throne was. During the short period of time that John VI was emperor, the last seven years, six, seven years, he saw civil wars, he saw the loss of territory to, um, to, to countries in Asia. Eventually, in the third civil war, he was deposed. But when John, no matter what John did, it's said that John was the most successful, inept emperors um, that the Byzantine world had ever seen. And when I say most successful, inept emperors, what I mean by that is a play in words. He was very competent, but what he was up against was a grim backdrop. Whatever he tried was going to make things worse. Whatever he didn't try was going to make things worse. Now you can imagine, it's 1347. Um, he's got a meeting with the traders and the traders turn around to say, hang on a minute, we've got all these goods from the Black Sea. Why don't we trade them all the way, way around the Mediterranean? And it's, it's at that moment in 1347, when he comes to the throne, that the Black Death is hitting the Black Sea region. So what you've got is traders coming from the Black Sea, going past the Bosphorus, um, going into for some supplies at Constantinople, spreading the Black Death to people in Constantinople, going through the Mamaria Sea, um, spreading the Black Death all the way around the, um, the Aegean, then going um, all the way to the likes of Italy. And then you can imagine... Um, you can imagine the disaster that this is causing. Even though he's trying to rebuild his country, his, his merchant fleet is actually spreading these diseases all the way across Europe unknowingly. You know, they didn't know this at the time. John's record was grim. He was a very competent em emperor. A close look at his decision shows him to be, to be as wise as could be hoped for, to go down the left or the right slope illustrating the awful predicament. Such were the dire straits the empire found itself in, that one of its most able and honest men had such a disastrous reign. He couldn't win. He couldn't get things right. And within six years, he had been dethroned. This is John himself. And as I say, John, John the Sixth is important because of what he was up against. Um, and he, interesting enough, he, he, was, he died at the age of 91, by the way. So there's some hope for us all. So what I'm thinking of doing now is um, I'm thinking that we should probably um, have a little bit of a break. Um, but before we have our break, I'd like to mention a couple of things if we're looking at this. Um, by the way, this, this plan is slightly fundamentally wrong. Um, so we'll sort of fill it in a little bit. So over here is a place known as Pera, which is in fact the, um, a little Venetian colony, a little Venetian um, uh, city that's not at war with Mehmed. Um, what is also missing is the walls of Constantine, but you can actually find that you've got the um, walls of Byzantium. You've got the walls of Theodosius, named after Theodosius II in 1420. You've got this here, the legendary gate that apparently allowed the Muslims into the city. And within hours, the Muslims captured the city. Well, actually, I, I sort of disagree with that sort of little chain of events. What's, what's happening in the, um, in the early hours of the 29th of May, 1453, um, the Islamic army actually breaches these walls and they send somebody over to um, open the gate 
in doing so, they actually pour into the city. But this is an interesting thing. This is a golden chain. When I say it's a golden chain, it's a chain of iron that um, goes across the horn, stopping the Islamic Navy getting into the horn. Um, so that th this area here, they can actually defend this area from, um, from attack quite easily. Um, but the city's being attacked from all sides. Just, just, a, just an idea of the task that these, th these defenders actually have to deal with. Um, they're, having to, they're having to defend a wall, the Theodosian Wall, which is five kilometers in length. And if you wanna, if you wanna divide uh, the amount of defenders, and then you go all the way down here, you've got another five kilometers all the way along. If you wanna chuck another five kilometers in, I would love somebody to do the maths on this. How many men would be needed um, per square, per, start again, how many men um, are available to defend one kilometer length of wall? So you've got 15 kilometers of wall that you've got 8,000 men to defend it against an attacking army of between 80 and 120,000. If somebody can do that quick equation um, after the break, I'll be very grateful. So what we're going to do, um, I want to know, um, have you got anything you'd like to say, Jessica? No. No? Okay. Be good. Um, I've never really sort of looked into anything to do with Constantinople, uh, Constantinople. So it was quite I interesting. Can't. I think. I can't say it. Actually... <laughs> yeah, no, it is a bit of a it's a bit of a hand, handful. Constantin <laughs> Con Constantinople. Go on. Constantinople. That's the one. Good. Yeah, carry on. Um, I've I've never really looked into it, and I think it's very interesting to um see how because i've done a bit of research on it before i um then the uh came to the lecture what did I knew you come across well i looked on the ancient history and encyclopedia um i knew it was a very high highly fertile um area for agriculture yeah um and i just knew that it was um romanized in some sort of way but it, they were still independent from yes. Rome, but that's yeah. what I just knew from it anyway. But it was interesting to know more about it, especially with um, the defence around the whole of the city. Um, and and you know, uh, it, it's quite it's quite a big frontier to try and um, it, it, you know that that's that's fifteen kilometres of wall to defend mm. uh, with eight thousand soldiers, which is quite which by any stroke of the imagination um yeah I, I want that answer hopefully somebody's already come to that answer so they can tell us how many men were available to man one kilometer length of wall i'm hoping that we'll get their answer um, um anyway so what we'll do we'll put the we'll put the mics um on now so uh let's get everybody on um and let's let's close my duda okay right um, all the mics um, unmuted. Um, would anyone like to say something? That was very good so far. Do you know, you, you, you said that today and somebody said that in the Lanswick Major class and I'm thinking, if it's very good so far, right, does it mean in the second half it's going to get really bad? No, we we're better. anticipating it getting a lot better. Oh, really right, yeah. Uh, actually, it does get a lot better because I found a document <coughs> that you'll find is very, very useful. Has, has anyone actually work, worked out the facts and figures? Bill, have you worked that one out yet? How many men were required? 550 per kilometre versus 5,400. Um, yeah, so 550 per kilometre. But so potentially what, could be against 5,000 per kilometer. So that's still 10 to 1. And if we yeah. um, actually, actually, that you're, you're wrong in one way, because I tell you what, um, 10 kilometers of that wall are along the seaward side. So if you've got 10 kilometers of wall along the seaward side, and most of Mehmed's men are on the landward side, that means you're putting out, uh, out of action, um, 
so on the seaward side, that's uh, what's the maths on that? And then you work out that, that the men on the landward side are facing greater odds. Do you get what I'm saying, Henry? Yeah. So, so the odds on the landward side are far greater. I well, would like those double figures. it. Yeah, double it. So it's 20 to 1? Yeah. That, that doesn't look good, does it? Um, Bill, what would you like to say? You said you had 8,000 men defending a wall 15,000 meters long? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that would mean one soldier every two meters apart, which one, may be adequate. May be socially adequate. distant. Socially yeah, it distant. is actually, yeah. I figured out. 8,000 men, 15,000 kilometers, sorry, um, meters. About one, one soldier every two meters on, on the ramparts, I reckon. Uh, with one soldier having to face off um, 20. Yeah, okay. But uh, they're in a defensive position, aren't they? They are in a defensive position, but you're having to d defend quite a big front. So, um, yeah, yeah, you're up against it. But exactly. at least they're, they're in a position of, um, of defense. Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. Under position, you know, so, uh, yeah. Exactly. Um, right, would, thank you for that, you two. Um, anything you would like to say, Patricia? Um, no, I think that's fantastic. I hope to go there someday. Um, well, as long as you say two meters apart on the wall um, <laughs> and you tell people why, then you'll be okay. And Annie Fanny, would you like to say anything? Because we want a break. I can't unmute her, unfortunately. <laughs> So uh, anyway, I, I am a bit confused with the sort of people who were kind of in the um, in Constantinople. You know, they they were Roman, but then they they weren't because I suppose they would be all local people, wouldn't they? Right, or a okay. mixture. Right, they're a mixture of people. But basically, by the time Ooh. by the by the time you get to here in fourteen fifty three. We've got records yeah. of Muslim Turks living within the city. You've got um, Christians of all types. You've got um, right. Jews as well. You've got various oh. traders, Venetians, mm -hmm. Genoese. Um, you, this, this is a major trading port. So it's so cosmopolitan that you, you're unable to put your thumb onto it. And there's actually, there's actually one interesting fact at the end if I, um, about a group of Cretan sailors defending Constantinople. So anyway, Jessica. Um, wasn't it found by Greek colonists? Yes, well? it was. About 500 years BC, yes. Right, okay. So, okay, let's, let's take a break, folks. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and the interesting fact, okay. the one, one interesting fact, this city itself is, is one of the longest um, consecutively occupied cities anywhere on the planet. Um, for over 2,500 years. There's a fact wow. for your history books. Damascus was the first one. What's that? Damascus was the first one. The oldest inhabited city on the earth was Damascus, apparently. Damascus, that would make sense. It would, yes. Yeah. Ka Kathleen Kenyon's work. Uh, right, let's take a break. Right. See you in a bit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna run past. Fifty I'm got for selling my coat. Fifty for selling my blanket. Dear, dear Michael, done and shared far and wide, Lawrence. I've, I've got everyone's gone. Everyone's gone. They've all gone. Oh, hang on. Um, I need to pause that.
Zoom recording, right, so part two. Um, let, let's be very sensible, as I always am. And we, we've, we've extensively covered um, the ups and downs, and let's get back, let's get directly onto the walls of, uh, of this city. So let's sort of um, put you all over there. Good. I can hear Jessica and um, Henry, but I can't see you. So we can see you, but you can see me. Oh, that's the amazing thing. You know, I like you. I, oh, Jessica, I know you like looking at me. It's fine. It's fine. Um, right. So the fall of Constantinople occurred um, between the 1st of April and the 29th of May in the year 1453. And the actual day of the collapse of the defences was of the night of the 29th of May and up until about 12 o'clock the following day um, of 1453. This, this, was, this was a siege um, of over 50 days um, from the point of Mehmed getting there after his army had got there in front of him uh, the 5th or 6th of April um, and then the siege is basically continuous. It doesn't actually go the, the Ottomans way at the beginning at all. Ascending to the throne in 1451, Mehmed II began making um, preparations to reduce the Byzantine capital of Constantinople through um, the seat of Byzantine power for over a million years, the empire had badly eroded after the city's capture in 1204 during the Fourth Crusade. Reduced to the area around the city as well as a large part of the Peloponnese and that's all, the empire was led by Constantine the Ninth. The Constantine XI, already possessing a fortress on both sides of the Bosphorus, uh, Mehmed began making plans after he became Sultan and leader of the Ottoman Empire in 1451. The, the control that the Ottomans exerted over both sides of that peninsula uh, was enough to be a direct threat to Genoese and Venetian trade. It was definitely a threat to the Byzantine trade. However, uh, the Byzantines came to an agreement with Mehmed II. And the agreement was, you're able to build um, a fortress close by to us on this side of the Bosphorus. Uh, we, we'll, just, um, we'll just leave you alone. Uh, that, that's basically the, the situation. Um, but by 1453, things become untenable. And the Genoese, um, alongside um, the Byzantines, asked for the help of Pope Nicholas V. Um, and the Genoese, um, which Genoese trade is based um, in Italy, said to the Pope, look, I, I, know, I know you absolutely hate the Orthodox more than you hate the Muslims, but what would you prefer? Uh, the Muslims being in charge of Constantinople um, or the Greek Orthodox. And it was, it was a close line between it, but Nicholas agreed to um, seek help in the West um, and to send that army in the West over to help the Eastern Roman Empire. This was largely fruit, fruitless as many of the Western nations were engaged in their own conflicts and could not spare men or money to aid Constantinople. So this is the approach at the beginning and the end. Now, I love illustrations like this, however accurate they are or however not accurate they are. It sort of gives you an idea of the struggle. This was day in, day out. The Byzantine defenders on those walls would have been absolutely exhausted. And when you actually look at the, the number of Byzantine soldiers inside that tower and the number of Byzantines along that wall, it goes against those figures that Henry and Bill calculated. There's obviously too many Byzantine um, soldiers on that wall. And, and, and if this is after, as we would think, about three or four weeks, there'd already be lots of Byzantines dead. So what I'd like to do, I'd like to rush forward a little bit. There's a, there's a little bit of text that I'd like to read out. So we've got all those nice little images. So you can imagine, this is, this is on the eve of the siege, right? This, this is before April the 1st. This is, um, this is almost a letter written um, by Mehmed to um, Constantine XI. 
you can imagine you can imagine him you can imagine him writing it down he's saying dear consty baby i hope the missus is okay and i hope the children are okay and how is constantinople i'm really sorry to tell you this please don't take it personally you stupid greeks i have had enough of your devious ways the late sultan was a lenient and conscientious friend to you my father the present sultan, i.e. me, is not of the same mind. If Constantine alludes to his bold and impetuous grasp, it will only be because God continues to overlook your cunning and wicked schemes. You are fools to think you can frighten us with your fantasies, and that when the ink on our recent treaty is barely dry. We are not children without strength or reason. If you think you can start something, then do so. If you want to proclaim Orphan as Sultan in Thrace, go ahead. Interjection, folks. Um, um, Orhan, not Orphan, Orhan um, is a Muslim uh, Sultan in Thrace, which is basically um, part of modern, modern day Greece, sort of Bulgaria type way. Um, and he, this, um, this Orhan, was somebody who could have actually um, been ruler of the Ottoman world. And Mehmed didn't want um, somebody who, who could have been, been a potential leader against him. Um, anyway, moving on. If you want to bring the Hungarians across the Danube, let them come. If you want to recover the places which you lost long since, try it. But know this, you will make no headway in any of these things. All that you will achieve is to lose what little you still have. Sorry for that really overhand letter, Consty Babes. Here's a cake from the, one of my missuses. Hope to see you soon, Consty. Don't take things personally. One day they're going to call me Mehmed II. Uh, or Mehmed the Conqueror. Or Mehmed the Great. Which title do you prefer to call me by? All my love. Mehmed. Maybe, maybe. Um, but the thing is, Mehmed was really sick and tired of the Byzantines. He, he had just had enough because this was a this was a tiny this was a tiny city with their supporters in Greece, um, stopping um, the Ottoman Empire doing exactly what it wanted to. Um, and actually, the, the ones who declared war um, on on Mehmed first was actually um, Constantine the Eleventh, because um, Orhan he basically brought Orhan over um, to assist him, and basically the Sultan took this as a declaration of war. So it was the Byzantines who caused this, and it was the Byzantines who caused their own downfall. Um, on the eve of eve of greatness is the eve of disaster. So let's sort of get back to these really nice illustrations, and. Looking at the city, on the side of the um, uh, the Golden Horn between um, Pera, which is the Venetian city, and Constantinople um, on the southern side, um, you have this chain, and that's what's left of this iron chain. This iron chain alone stopped um, the Ottoman fleet of 70-odd vessels getting in between these two individual cities in the Golden Horn, which would have jeopardized, which would have jeopardized um, those defenders even more. They would have been even more stretched along those walls. The Ottomans approach. Here we go. Though no large-scale help was forthcoming, smaller groups of independent soldiers did come to the city's aid. Among these were 700 professional soldiers under the command of Giovanni Gustiani. 700 professional soldiers, it would have made really no difference. However, these were trained soldiers working to improve Constantine's defenses, Constantinople's defenses. Constantine XI ensured that the massive Theodosian walls were repaired and that the walls in the northern Balkan district were strengthened. The Balkan the district. So what I need to do, let's just stop faffing around you. Let's get a little bit of a map on you so you know exactly where you're going. 
And when, just, just quickly, you know, I said about the double skin, the triple skin walls, the lower skin, internal skin, middle skin, and then you've got another skin of wall on top of that, just as the three layers you can see now. So let's, let's, that's where we're talking about, right? So there, there's, um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to do some little drawing whilst I'm up here. I like my drawing. This is the best part of those lectures. As Dell knows, Dell knows the only reason why I do the Wednesday evenings is so I can do my drawing. I know he's nodding his head and agreeing. So um, this is basically, these are Theodosian walls, the three, the three sort of, um, the three skins of the wall. Um, and it was meant to be a ditch um, full of water um, on the um, Mehmed side, but obviously it, it wasn't. Um, and this is what they're saying. They strengthened the walls in the Balkan area. Um, and then this gate here is a gate that comes into history. Um, and it said that this was the most vulnerable area that could be prone from attack because before they, um, before they blocked off the golden horn with this chain, there were, some, there were already some, um, some um, Ottoman vessels uh, in here. There were some Ot Ottoman vessels. Um, so, you know, they needed to do something up there. So that's exactly what was going on. Short on men, Constantine um, directed that the bulk of his forces defend the Theodosian walls. So here we go. So what I need to do, let's get the, uh, let's get the yellow in there. There you go. There it is. Um, the bulk of the men defend these walls. But as we did with the table, they would have had to have been men along this long length of wall defending it. Uh, and look at that. You know, this is vulnerable to naval attacks. So, you know, this, this is what's going on. They, 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 all of this has to be defended. And it, it's, you know, all together from top to bottom, over five kilometers of wall needing defended um, on, on the landward side, let alone the t um, um, 10 kilometers on the seaward side. So, you know, this Mehmed believed that this would be a quick victory. You know, this, this would be over and done with really rapidly. Um, and down here, um, one now this is rather interesting, right? On the plan, it shows these big cannons all the way around, right? There was one cannon, not all of these, right? Um, and it goes to say, approaching the city with his um, nearly 120,000 men, Mehmed was supported by a fleet, as we know. In addition, he possessed a large cannon made by the founder, Urban, um, as well as several smaller guns. So these are all his several smaller guns all over the place, right? Here we go. Um, and by the way, nobody is attacking, um, nobody's attacking these um, Venetians. Nobody's attacking them. So actually that's where the plan's wrong because uh, they're not gonna be there. Um, this cannon itself um, took three hours to reload. Um, so, by the time they had fired the cannon, between them firing it and reloading it, it took three hours. So um, basically it meant that the um, Constantinian soldiers were able to block it back up again or sort of put carts and stuff in the way. Uh, the Can lead I just add something there? Yeah, no, please do. I need a break. Yeah, quick, just quickly, um, if you ever go to the Royal Armouries at Portsmouth on Portsmouth Hill, um, they actually have examples of the Ottoman cannons um, from that this type of era. They're bronze. They're about 1.8 meters long, and they weigh about 18 tons. Yes. Now, the, the those 1.8 those would be the smaller ones. Um, this 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 one that I'm talking about is six meters in length. Yeah, there's one there that screws together. It comes in two parts. Yeah. And. Uh, they screw the whole thing together and it fires a, a, a rock cannon. It's, they then didn't use lead, they used actual boulders. And you, you, you start to think how effective would, how effective would that be? Um, somebody's actually left a message. Um, oh, and saying, wow. Oh, well, you know, she, she's always impressed by size, I've got to be honest with you. So yeah, you are right, and, and, and thanks for that because this is this is at the time that artillery is 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 really starting to be used. 
Um, it's only 20 years earlier that the conquistadors are using small cannons against the Inca. So, you know, this is 20 years on and, and the, the Ottomans are actually making their own cannons. They're not dependent upon the West. So, so the, these are pounding the walls. They are having some effect, but after naturally 50 days, you know, that combined is going to have an effect. So this, this is the siege. It's, it's not the longest siege in history, but I, I've known much shorter ones than this. The siege of Constantinople, um, he tightened his noose around Constantinople. Elements of his army swept through the region, capturing minor Byzantine outposts. Uh, in placing his large cannon, he battered the, the Theodosian walls. Um, on the water, um, Solomon Botrika's uh, fleet, which is going to be over um, here, there's his fleet, is unable to get through this iron chain. It might be just an iron chain, but when you've got an iron chain in water, you can hardly send people over the side with hacksaws, and it's going to be really difficult to break it. And that remained in place for the whole 50 days, amazingly, keeping this fleet back. Otherwise, the, the, um, otherwise the campaign would have been won by Mehmed a lot sooner. And the one thing the, con the, one thing the people within the city needed was more time. Um, then again, I'm thinking, you know, the, the one question I thought, which, which I haven't really been able to work out, uh, Henry and Jessica, is, is why, why over 50 days, knowing full well that they're going to lose the city? Did, mo did a big percentage of the civilians stay on? Um, and, and I'm thinking, I, I, I'm just thinking, did they actually stay on? Um, because they had all those opportunities to evacuate and they didn't. Um, and when we look at the text at the end, which is that separate text, which, which I've got, um, is, it, is it true or not? Anyway, we'll go on to that in a short while. So anyway, um, this, this one thing that was embarrassing for Mehmed was that um, Christian supply ships kept getting through. Um, a miniature fleet managed to get through to Constantinople on April the 20th with all the harrying um, by the um, Ottoman Navy. And in fact, the Ottoman Navy were actually afraid of Genoese and Venetian ships uh, because Genoese and Venetian ships were a lot better than theirs and also if you want to compare a Byzantine vessel uh, with an Ottoman vessel, Byzantine vessels um, spewed forward Greek fire, which is basically under, under pressure um, oils, um, which, which set a light, a, um, a pump forward under pressure, a bit like a little pump gun, and it, it just spews over Greek fire over to an enemy vessel, and they were, they were afraid of that. Uh, but they, and they'd been using Greek fire for, for hundreds of years. Um, so one thing was, is as the deadlock, there's basically a deadlock. Um, and it had been a deadlock for two weeks. So Mehmed basically said, right, all right, what we're going to do, uh, if we can't get the ships beyond this metal chain, we'll drag them over land. So that's exactly what they did. They dragged the vessels over land, all 70 of them over land. And it apparently took two days to drag the whole fleet over land. That's how many men were available. Um, they dragged the whole fleet, 70 vessels, over land. So that meant that, that after the 23rd of April, they could directly threaten the, the northern part of the city. It's not, it's, this, this is now putting massive pressure. And, and strangely enough, the Venetian vessels that were neutral... Uh, remained berthed in the harbour and the Venetians were just looking, oh, look about what's going on, you know. If the Venetians had got involved, it might have turned out slightly differently. Actually, the Venetians should have sided with Mehmed and the, the city would have, been, uh, would have been taken sooner. But the Venetians dilly-dally, they didn't side with anybody and at the end of the day, they lost their city as well. And nobody, nobody says anything about Pera, um, which is by that green line. So, um, and also, the Venetians um, were turncoats as well. They, um, um, on the 28th of April, after, the, um, uh, after five days after the fleet um, of Solomon had managed to be dragged across land, um, the Genoese and the Byzantines said to um, the Venetians, right, keep your ships out of the way, right? We're going to send a fire, a fire fleet to destroy um the ottoman navy 
um, and the Venetians told Mehmed this. Um, and what happened, it was actually, in lots of ways, it was a good thing because um, uh, Mehmed's, um, Mehmed's army, led by Solomon, was so afraid of these fire ships that they really didn't play into much more of the action of the, of the, of the um, siege. Um, Ottoman sailors, as I said, were afraid of their enemy, which wasn't a good thing. So um, it was hoped that um, pressure could be placed um, on, the, on the northern walls by the Blackernan um, gate, uh, which is up here. Um, and so what happened, instead of the Navy actually d um, involved in naval actions, the sailors went ashore. So that put more pressure on these, mm. these walls. But then again, they couldn't break through. They just could not break through. Um, so a few other interesting things. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to read this whole thing out. And then um, I'm going to move on to um, this other text. So we'll be going to the end and the end of the siege, and we'll go back, back again. That's the only way of doing it. An initial assault um, against the Theodosian walls um, completely failed. Now, where was our, um, where was our Constantine? Constantine was here and Mehmed was somewhere over here. So they were probably well far apart. Now there was another general, there was an Italian general over here defending the Northern walls um, for the uh, Byzantines. Now constantly, um, they were attacking day in, day out. Um, and I don't know if I said this, but there was, there was Turks fighting on the side of the Byzantines and there were Christians fighting on the side of the Ottomans. So that tells you of the mixed up situation. This is not, not just about religion. This is about one side versus another. Um, and undermining the walls were Serbian sappers um, led by a guy by the name of Zaganos, uh, Zaganos Pasha. Zaganos Pasha led these sappers and they undermined the walls. And what they were going to do, they, they were going to undermine the walls and they were going to uh, either put explosives in there or nobody really knows. And the Byzantines had a trump card. They had, they had an engineer with them, Johannes Grant. And Johannes uh, intercepted all these mines because what they could see, they could see they could see people going underground in the distance from the walls. And I said, hang on, they're going over there. So they actually managed to intercept all these mines. So you can imagine Mehmed's pulling his bloody air out at this point. He's thinking, Christ, you know, all our mines are being intercepted. You know, mine after mine as they're undermining the wall is being intercepted. But naturally, they're, they're, bit by bit, they're weakening the walls. Um, and on the one occasion when um, they captured two Turkish um, officers, um, on the 23rd of May, and they, they interrogated these officers. Um, and they actually, by the 25th of May, they actually found all the remaining mines that were trying to undermine the wall. And they found, and, and basically that was it. So Mehmed was, was absolutely furious now. Every single attempt, the, every single attempt um, to actually capture the city, to actually get into the city was not a pun, was being undermined by, by the intelligence of the Byzantines. But, but uh, Mehmed also knew that probably at this point, half of the defending forces on the Byzantine side were dead. Uh, the, the, the army of Constantine could not spare any men. So you're talking about at this stage, if you're talking about 4,000 dead and injured and some evacuated, you're talking about a force of probably about 4,000 at this stage defending the walls, which, it, which as you've done the facts, um, that means that this is dire straits. Um, despite the success, Constantinople began to plummet as word was received that no aid would be coming from Venice. The Venetians were not gonna declare war on Mehmed. They had too much to lose, including all their people in, in, um, in Pera. In addition, a series of omens, including a thick, unexpected fog, which blanketed the city on May the 26th, convinced many that the city was about to fall. So why the bloody hell didn't they evacuate sooner? Then again, they probably did. Believing that the fog masked the departure of the Holy Spirit from the Hagia Sophia. Now, there is, 
the Hagia Sophia there. Oh, hang on, I've used the wrong thing there. There is the Hagia Sophia, and there's the Grand Palace. Um, there's the Hippodrome. You've right. seen images of the Hagia Sophia. It looks absolutely massive. Yeah. So what was the? How big was this palace? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It was huge. Anyway, um, and it's actually said. Um, I read one report that um, that the Empress barricaded herself in the palace, and they couldn't get her out, so they just left her there. Um, but I don't know how much of that is true. Um, anyway, so Mehmed was getting frustrated. He was getting really, really frustrated. Everything, you know, things weren't really going his way. Uh, he really thought this was going to be a walkover, but it wasn't. On May the 28th, um, one day before the fall of um, Constantinople, Mehmed sent his janissaries in. Um, he sent his auxiliaries in to weaken the walls. The janissaries were the, his elite, but he was also, he was sending his auxiliaries in. He was just basically putting everything in there. This, this was the time he was going to put everything in there. Absolutely everything. Um, and this was going to weaken the walls. But most of the janissaries uh, were kept back is his elite guard. Um, and slowly but surely, they were actually making headway over here. They were actually breaching the walls. Bit by bit, they were being pushed back. Um, Giovanni Gustiani, the leader of the Italians and the Byzantine forces up here, were, were making counterattack. And, and strangely enough, they were pushing, the, um, they were pushing um, the Ottoman back over the wall. They were just actually virtually pushing them back over the wall. Uh, this was the fighting. But when a great commander is injured, Giovanni Gustiani, when he's injured, things no longer go the way of the Byzantines. We're hours from collapse. We are hours. Um, so what's happening next? And then, then we've got my, my other text that we're going to go on to. Uh, what's happening next is that bit by bit, um, bit by bit, the, the defences are, are really starting to fall. Even though they're pushing them back, there's less and less Byzantines to actually do it. Um, the other part of the story is, is that down here um, is our, let's put him in there. Down here is Constantine himself with the other part of the army. So you've got, you can imagine that everything's slowly start to break down. Constantine's down in the south, and this is not the base, best place for him to be, but he's under heavy pressure. Unbeknown to him, whilst he's under heavy pressure, the Ottomans actually breach the wall and they actually start flooding in and they get over to this gate. And this is the famous gate known as the um, um, Kara Porter Gate. Now, what's, what I'm told in school, when I was in school, they said about the Kara Porter Gate, um, that a very large, um, a very large Muslim um, got in, got past the gate, um, and ran up to the top of the tower and waved um, Mehmed's flag as a sign for the army to pour through the gate. It's also said, um, this is what I was told, that um, that one of the defenders, one of the Byzantines left the gate open after going outside for a pee. And, and you're starting to think, why would somebody go outside, go for a pee, and then come back in and leave the gate open? I, I, I never thought that that was true. What had happened is that they had, the uh, Mehmed's army had already broken through, and they aimed for that gate to allow the rest of the army in, and that's exactly what happened. At this moment, Constantine was completely unaware of this, but at the same time, Constantine had a break um, in his own defenses. And basically, um, the enemy started pouring through. And this is that you're absolutely pouring in now, and you can see the effect. So, what's happening is that the army, the fall back line, is going to be on this, this wall leading across here. There's another wall. Um, that's going to be the fallback line. But unfortunately, Constantine and his men are trapped. They're trapped and they're being attacked from all sides. They're not only being attacked from 
um, this from here, from all the way from behind, they're actually now being attacked from the coast as well. So Constantine is completely surrounded. He has got no chance. They are pouring into the city um, and nobody knows what happened to Constantine. All that they found of Constantine was his purple slippers. I kid you not, guys. Uh, in the history, it writes that his purple slippers were found, but his body was not found. Some say that Constantine was evacuated from the city after he was injured. Some say he died fighting. Some say he died after a war collapsed on him. Some say he was captured by Mehmed's men and beheaded. Nobody knows. That's unlikely that um, he would probably have been taken to Mehmed in chains. Um, but that's something else. As, as, the, as the Ottomans uh, poured into the city, Mehmed allowed his men to only plunder areas of the city that he had allowed them to plunder. Key buildings like the Hagia Sophia were not to be touched. The Hippodrome was not to be touched. There were certain buildings which were not to be touched. This was a city that was now going to be his capital city of his new empire. So he needed all these buildings to be kept intact. So what I'm going to do, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to sort of lead us on to, um, lead us on to the remaining images. And I want to do this last, last stuff. So we've got these beautiful... Um, there's the chain. We've got the, there's the cannon there, that absolutely massive cannon. Um, now, whether it's, as you are so right, some cannonballs were actually made of stone. Um, but I fancy if you're firing a stone cannonball, it's going to ex explode in the barrel. So, um, and the other, the reason, the reason why um, it takes three hours to reload this, one, you have to let it cool down. Um, when it's cooled down, um, you've got to then um, fill it with charge. Um, then you've got to um, get it sort of lined up on the wall. And then you need to have everything in place for it to be fired in the first place. And again, we've seen that. Um, and, and basically, um, the position is, here we go, we'll do the aftermath and then we'll, then we'll, then we'll go go back in. So the aftermath of the fall of Constantinople, Ottoman losses are unknown. It was probably in around 20,000. Uh, Con Constantinople would have lost all of its army, either um, through dead, uh, injured, evacuated, or enslaved. Um, again, that slavery bit, um, bone of contention with me on that one. It's said that this was such a devastating blow to Christendom Nicholas V then thought, oh, what we're going to do, Nicholas V, the Pope, he said, look, what we're going to do, um, we're going to send an army in to recover the city. Despite his pleas, no Western monarch stepped forward to lead the effort. A turning point in Western history, the fall of Constantinople is seen as the end of the medieval period and the beginning of the Renaissance. Fleeing the city, Greek scholars arrived in the West, bringing with them priceless knowledge and rare manuscripts. Now, th this is a key point, guys. If the Greek scholars are able to leave with their manuscripts, right, it's an indication that they didn't leave in a rush. They must have planned this leaving. Fashion. Yeah, exactly. Because, you, you, you know, you can imagine it, right? Henry, do a bit of a play, right? You're desperate to leave with your family, right? And I run upstairs and say, Henry, I've got to save these manuscripts. And then you're going, so. don't be a fool, man. Do you know what I mean? So while you, are, you are right. So I, I don't think so. I, I think that this was, it was a prepared evacuation. I don't think it's as dramatic as lots of the historians tell us. Do you know what I mean? I, 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 this is my feeling. This was my gut on this. I've, I've felt this for many years. The loss of Constantinople also severed European trade links with Asia. Not only is this the, the, the period of the start of the Renaissance and, and illumination, the, the, the Ottoman world was at the head of science and, and, um, and medicine and everything for 200 years and still, until they were stopped at the gates of Vienna. Yeah, you're right, um, 200 years later. But the thing is, um, because, because trade... Um, with the Black Sea and other places are now controlled by the Muslims, um, traders started going elsewhere. And this is how you look at the age of exploration. Um, you look at Christopher Columbus, an Italian, you look at um, 
Americo Vespucci. Some people believe America was named after Americo Vespucci. That's Vespucci. Um, and all is funded by the Italian, the, the Portuguese, um, and the Spanish, the age of exploration. Um, and it, and this, the end of these empires, the end of these three empires was actually in 1919. Um, so what I'm going to do now, and the reason why all these gateways are blocked up is because Mehmed was absolutely petrified because the body of Constantine was not found. He, he was petrified that Constantine is going to come knocking on these gates one day with an army um, led by the Holy Spirit. He, he thought, so he blocked up these gateways to stop him coming in, to defend against the Holy Spirit of Constantine XI. He was highly suspicious and highly respected. I know we read that statement earlier on, but I, I, he, did, he did respect Constantine XI. And I'm, and I'm thinking... I don't think he would have had him beheaded if, his, if he did find him alive. Constantine wouldn't have wanted to have been found alive, to be honest with you. He's lost it. He's lost everything. So, you know, um, so this, this, is, this is more of the fighting. And again, it's, it's overemphasizing the defenders, I think. Too many defenders. Um, and what I'm going to do now, we're going to look at some more images. Again, I love these illustrations. I, I love the way this is done. The three tiers of walls, the one tier, the outer tier, the middle tier, um, and the inside tier. Um, and then what you've got, Mehmed himself. And what we're talking about, we're talking about in the very late years of the Byzantine Empire, all they had was this purple bit and not this bit. This is um, 1450. By 1453, there was hardly any of it left. Um, and... There is Constantine the 11th. And what we're going to do, a bit of a, a cartoony image and another gate. Mehmed entering the city. And there it is again. So what I would like to do is go back to that nice little plan. And you can imagine I could do another hour on this. But anyway, look, looking at this. Now, I would like to... I would like to play around with this document that I've got, okay, before we finish. Here we go. This is, this is, about, the, um, this is about the refugee, refugees. Um, nevertheless, scores of unexpected refugees must have reached the ships and must have been taken aboard. One of the writers, um, Tetatladi, was one of those who was able to swim to the ships and was rescued. The fact that the Venetian ships remained at their, their, their anchorage for some time was indeed a welcome development for potential refugees. The writer notes and also observed that a large number was taken on board. Meanwhile, some galleys of the Venetians went out to sea early in the morning and remained in a safe place near the plundered city until after midday, as they wished to protect and save as many Christians as possible. Um, it's saying that almost four, uh, 400 refugees swam out to them in their boats alone. Um, relative, to, uh, relative to this, now this is, this is an interesting point. I didn't know this until I read it. It's a brilliant document. If we go down to the south here, into these ancient harbours along this area here, there was a number of coastal towers. Um, and I think this is where this description comes from. The writer Tetaldi um, continued, um, continued to write, and we should mention the existence. Um, he says that Tetaldi um, said that there was continued resistance to the Turks, even though it had become clear that the city had been uh, penetrated. Such isolated pockets of resistance must have continued throughout Constantinople for some hours, if not days. After the ingression, a clear example of resistance is the fortified house of Lucas Lotarus, the Grand Duke, whose retainers endured for some time after the entry of the Turks until the Grand Duke himself reached the house and arranged surrender. There is also mention of an isolated pocket that involved the supposed crew of a, 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 a crew of a Cretan boat. So this is basically where those ancient harbors are. This is what this talks about. Right. And I, I, I like this, this little entry. 
pseudo spratzes relates um, this occurrence and it should be stressed at the outset that his account is not supported by any other authoritative text in fact he is the only author to mention this incident and it goes uh, in the translated text they the turks took control of the entire area with the exception of the towers basalios leon and alexos which were manned by cretian sailors who bravely continued the struggle into the sixth and seventh hour and killed many Turks, although they saw their numbers and were aware that the whole city was enslaved, they refused to be enslaved and maintained that death was preferable to life. When a Turk reported their bravery to the Sultan, he ordered them to come down under a truth, a truce. So you're not flying a white flag, you're going to fly the um, flag of the Sultan to basically say the Sultan accepts, you know, you need, we need to do something about this. So he declared the Sultan that they, their ship and all their equipment would remain free. Even so, the Turks had trouble persuading the Cretans to abandon that tower. Who were these sailors? The writer Pseudo Spratzes uh, mentions them in another section of his narrative when he apportions the distribution of the defenders along the wall. And the protection of the vicinity of the gate called Horia was given to the sailors, captains, and commanders of the ship from Crete. There are the addition problems that um, we're talking about topography. Um, and were they in one tower, um, historians ask, or were they in three towers? But you're thinking a crew of sailors holding out against thousands of Turks. It must have been quite a feat. Um, and one thing, one thing I wanted to do was before we actually finish today, and I've gone way over today, I want to get to the beginning of this document. Um, and if I can, if I can quickly find it, because it's quite a big document. I'm actually scrolling through this. Right, you, here, here we go. Um, this this is an in, in interesting thing. Um, while while the greed of the Turkish crews seems to have given the Venetians, um, the Genoans, and the Byzantines an opportunity to prepare for departure without having to fight, their departure was further facilitated by the incapacity of the Turkish vessels to offer serious pursuit. This is the irony of of greed, um, you guys. Since some Greek and other prisoners had been herded into, into the holds of the Turkish ships and all the booty rendering the craft incapable of further action. So it was because of the greed of the Turkish sailors that they were unable to engage the Venetians and the Genoans and the Byzantines full of um, you know, fleeing peoples and, and soldiers and all their booty. Um, but this, this thing is said as well by one of the writers all nuns were sent to the Turkish Armada, the, the 70 ships, and they were well dishonored and shamed by the Turks. Then they were sold into slavery for profit throughout Turkey. The same fate awaited all women who were shamed and then sold for handsome profit. But some of those women chose to drown themselves in wells rather than fall into hands of the Turks. So did some matrons. These Turks filled their entire um, a murder with prisoners and enormous beauty, uh, bank, uh, booty, enormous booty. Um, so when you're reading this, you're, you're thinking that, is this actually true? Um, when in fact, there are loads of people fleeing, um, there are loads of refugees leaving. I'm going to tell you one, one other thing that I, that I read years ago. Um, we'll, we'll finish there. Um, one, one other thing, um, that um, when the um, when they had got to the Hagia Sophia, um, lots of the noble women and the noble noble men were forced to derobe, um, and they all stood there naked, um, and the dishonouring um, is not what some people are reading. The dishonouring is to examine all their orifices for hidden gold um, and gems. Um, and that's, that's what's going on. So when they go into slavery, they've got nothing. They're completely naked um, in the nature of the term. 
Uh, there was so much more I wanted to tell you, but we're going to have to call it a day now. But I, I would like to just mention just one last final thing. Um, and the final thing is looking at these walls. Um, and again, don't forget to um, join me tomorrow on YouTube uh, at one o'clock. Um, go on to Carl J. Langford and you will be able to go on to YouTube. And we've got some various things that we discuss about the lecture this week. And finally, a bit of archaeology. They excavated the Hippodrome site. Um, and the Hippodrome site itself, um, there's not much left of it. Um, two things, I'm told, that um, in, when, they, when they originally excavated the Hippodrome site in the um, 1850s, um, I think these were troops um, going off to the... Um, um, Crimean War. When they excavated um, British troops um, in Istanbul, they found the remains of the Hippodrome and there was lots of it left. Um, more of it excavated in the 1920s. But unfortunately, due to the bombing um, in the First World War, um, most of what had been found in the 1850s, 60s had actually been destroyed. By the time they're excavating here, um, about a decade ago, under a decade ago, uh, these are all the remains of the Hippodrome site that they actually found. But the interesting thing to remark on finally is that this site was used by the Christians to have all their um, festivals and um, circuit racing, um, the charioteering racing and all the rest of it, which was still accepted in the Christian world up until about the 1260s. And interesting enough, Mehmed, um, um, gave a speech to his conquering and surviving soldiers in the Hippodrome um, and I'm sure the speech would have said we have now conquered Constantinople long live the new Roman Empire and on that moment we're going to call it a day so is there anything you would like to say um, Jessica and uh, Henry before we finish before we go on to the open the mics um, no I just thought that was a great lecture yeah, that was very interesting. I really enjoyed that. I did find an example of the siege cannon. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, bring it, bring it a bit. Oh, look at that. You can see it. And do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put that on full screen. Talk. I've lost. That's the 18 ton. Now that was made after the siege, but it was a bit within about f five years. And that sat down in Portsmouth, that is. And that's probably from bronze. That's uh, it's bronze, from... yeah. Oh, many thanks for that. That that's probably going to be from the bronze taken from Constantinople, anyway. <coughs> so, uh, right. So, um, what I'm going to do? Um, uh, anything else you'd like to say, Jessica? No, just thought that was great. It was really interesting. And you, you, thank you for that, both of you. You can really yeah. enjoy next week. You really will as well. So, Bill, anything you'd like to uh, say? Yeah, obviously the success of uh, Mehmet here encouraged him to spread westward. And I often wonder why um, in the Balkans um, there's such a strong Muslim influence. So obviously he actually got over as well and settled at some point. But you well, go to Croatia and Montenegro and Serbia, you'll see lots of mosques there. Yeah, you do. So, you do. Yeah, yeah. You do, you do. Yeah, it's uh, uh, the extreme point in history, wasn't it? It really was. Uh, the extreme point in history was the gates of Vienna. If um, if they had captured Vienna, they would have um, they would have streamed into um, Austria and they would have streamed into Germany and they would have definitely yeah. got over to France. And yeah. maybe there would have been another push from the Moors in through to Spain and history would have been very different. Yeah. And the empire, the, point, the Roman Empire would be reunited again. Yeah. The other point I've got, they were actually called the Ottomans before they invaded. Yes, they were. Did they? They were. Yes, they were. So where does the word Ottoman come from? Um, There's no Ottoman land anywhere. No, Ottoman Turk, i.e. the Turk, the, the Turk tribe that came in, we, where you get the, the names of Turkestan from. So you've got the Turk, the Turk people actually coming in, occupying Turkey. Um, but do you know what? Um, that's one question I can't answer because that's your homework for next week, Bill. Because I thought Turkey came from Demel of Ataturk. Um, he founded Northern Turkey, not no. Turkestan. No? <laughs> no, it's the name of the Turkish tribes. Yes. The people, yeah. the type of people. 
from from Turkestan. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 At Ataturk, lots of things were named after Ataturk as well, but Turkey is, yeah, that's, um, yeah. That, that comes from the, 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 the Turk tribe. So, Anne, would you like to say something? Well, obviously, I was a bit, bit more interested in the schism between the um, Roman Catholic Church and the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church, so, um, which I thought, you know, would I suppose it, it made different people really with different yeah. beliefs. Um, they're, 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 they're very different beliefs. It's, it's you know, and yeah. and uh, you know, uh, and of course, then the Muslims, you know, their their ideas were more could be more integrated into the Eastern to a certain extent, but um, you know, at the end of the day when it's war, war is war. And it, it doesn't, you know, people have to behave in a certain way. And, um, you know, we're all the same. We're all equal in war, really. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Um, what would you like to say, Del? Um, just a bit of humour. <laughs> Had, um, the Turks um, conquered Austria. I just had this thought in my head. Um, a lovely big mosque in Salzburg, um, with a nice big tall minaret, nice. and the Imam yodeling the call of prayer. Mm. Wow. <laughs> oh, wow. That, that would have um, left them, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, well, um, the last person who's got to say is um, Pat. Shopper oh. woman. Pat? Gonna speak. Pat. 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 You see me again? <laughs> <laughs> I think she's... Uh... Got effect on you. Well, you know that. What's that? You've got an effect on Pat, you know that. She always drops off to sleep when you're talking, you know that. Yeah, I, I know, I know, I know, I know. I, I, notice, I notice the names of everyone has changed as well. Oh, who did that? Good grief. <laughs> so, um, so, so if, if nobody's got anything else to say, that has been an absolute delight today. <coughs> I, I, I really appreciated that. Um, and... Um, and 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 uh, Jessica, we'll have to put your skills to teaching one day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if if you came on a Wednesday, yeah, you, know, you could do a little talk for us. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's Carl's there uh, <laughs> on a Wednesday. That's you know, no, it's, yes, Wednesday forum. What usually what happens is somebody gives a talk. They bring yeah. students, and you know, if they can, try and. Do it, you know. So that would be good for you to. I've yeah. got to go now. Yeah. Bye, Del. Anyway, see, see you, well, yeah. you. See you, Del. See you Saturday. Bye, Bye. Anyway, see you, Bill. How am I going to get? Uh, this? Anyway, I, I haven't said. Have you all enjoyed this today? Yes. 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 Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Many thanks, and um, and, and thanks for all taking part. And obviously, I'll see you Thursday or Wednesday. Anyway, keep talking a minute if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've sent you an email, Carl. What's that email been about, Frenchy? That will be about your gun. Ah, oh, chuck it. I'll, I'll look forward to reading it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, uh, have a good uh, time. Have you found anything? See, found anything? Henry's gonna. Henry sent it to Henry? me. I'll, I'll I'll read it out on Wednesday or something. Anyway, thanks for that, Frenchy. Okay. Bye bye. All have a good bye. week. Bye. We, we will. We will. We will. Right. So. Um, I'm here. I'm here. So, so, so uh, Jesse he asked if he wanted to say anything. He did. He did. I was. I wasn't with it then. <laughs> no, we we could tell. And everything tell. turned off. <laughs> we could tell. Right. So, um, Anne, I, I think it'd be a good idea on 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 Wednesday. Je uh, Jesse Babes could do um, yeah. a little. Basically, it's a little talk that you could do on a Wednesday. Um, yeah. And um, it's between one o'clock and um, two. And I send you, a, I send everybody a link. 
Yeah. Although it's a very small group. I don't usually take part. I just sort of set it up and sort of make sure that nobody's killing each other. Um, <laughs> and um, yes. Who have we got set up to do it already? Um, what, well, it, 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 don't, it don't matter. Je Jessie can do a little talk if she wants for 10 minutes on Wednesday. She yeah. can introduce herself. Oh, it was Pam. Oh, it was Pam. Oh, yeah, she's got to talk about something. I don't know how long. Give us a talk, and I, I think she's quite serious about, you know. <laughs> well, it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't matter. You can, you can all take part. And, and yeah, I mean, if you come on Wednesday, you know you'll yeah. see how it works. You'll see how it works, you know. Yeah. Yes. And, yeah. And tell us what you do and everything. Yeah. Yeah, no, I definitely would like that. Oh, look at the doggy. Oh, <laughs> a little doggy. Little doggy. Oh, yeah. Being all clingy, bless her. Yeah. <laughs> so I got to try and get this stone. I got to try and get this stone to you, Carl. The image of the stone, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll try and send it on Messenger to Carl James Langford. Okay, good. All right. Okay. Right. Well, I'm going now. So I, 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 lo I love the names oh, on it. Oh, thank you very much. What's What's that that lady? Lady? Well, How do I go? Yes, I gotta go, go fix dinner. Fix I, I, I've got to fix dinner as well and do the washing up. Anyway, um, <laughs> Pat, I will see you next week. Oh, well, here we oh, go. I'll be there tomorrow, <laughs> listening to you. Oh, well done, well done. And are you going to join us tomorrow as well, Jesse? Um, I think I am. It depends. Um, basically, my mum's friend, um, a little boy, he's been homeschooled now and she's asked me to teach him history. So mm -hmm. depending on what time it is, um, I'll join. Oh, actually, Jess, you know, you know, I actually teach to um, two children myself on a Wednesday. Do you? Yeah, I do. On, on a Wednesday at, um, I, I, I do that on a Wednesday between um, 2.30 and 3.30. Uh, okay, that's good. Because, um, I know someone who'd be interested now would be my little sister. So, yeah. So, well, I, t I tell you what, I'll send you the link for that on Wednesday as well. Yeah, no, that'd be perfect. Thank you. So, Wednesday forum and Wednesday uh, children, Jessica. Excellent. Brilliant. We'll do that. Right, okay, so, that's great. So, what I'm going to do, anything else, um, Pat, you want to ask me or Jesse, Jesse before you go? No, nope. that's fine. Thanks. See you tomorrow. I'll listen to you tomorrow. See you soon. Bye. See and Jessica, okay. join us tomorrow as well by YouTube. All right, okay. I got you on YouTube anyway, so I'll be notified straight away. Fab. Okay. Take care. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Ooh. Right. So I've sorted it. Don't worry. It's okay. Good. <laughs> My computer's playing up. No, I've got bye, it. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.